Hi, today is the fourth and final installment in our construction videos for the turbojet engine project. And today we're going to get into the starting system as well as the ignition system. Now, the combustor here burns fuel and requires a steady flow of fresh air in order to be able to produce that combustion. And that air is supplied by the compressor wheel. The compressor in turn is driven by the turbine. And because the system is not 100% efficient, there are thermodynamic losses, it becomes hot, there are frictional losses as the gas moves through the system, we need a sufficient amount of high pressure gas coming out of the combustion chamber that the turbine is able to overcome those losses and drive the compressor wheel. So to get this thing started, what we need to do is get this thing spinning. And in a large industrial or in a commercial jet engine, typically they will use a, an electric motor to begin to spin up the compressor wheel and produce that initial level of compression. In small RC turbochargers, what they will use is a small electric motor attached to the shaft to drive it. The problem with those systems, or the complexity, is the high speeds. In these small engines, they can go up to about 150,000 RPM, and that will just about tear apart any electric motor. So what they do is they incorporate a little bit of a connection or a, de a decoupling uh, spring on the motor, so that when they're starting it up, the motor will be in contact with the shaft. But then once the motor catches, once the engine catches and it begins to spool up, the motor will then decouple and no longer be spinning while the turbocharger or the turbine itself is spinning. That protects the motor. That works, obviously, but it is a little bit more complex and requires a little bit more machining than a simple air start, which is what most people use when they start these things on their own for the first time. And the way that they provide that air is usually using a leaf blower. They will take a leaf blower, which produces a fair velocity of compressed air. They will hold it in the opening of the engine. And then once they get everything spinning up, they'll reach down and they'll start adjusting the valves and the fuel flow to get the thing to fire up. As you can guess, this gets a little bit kludgy. It's hard to hold. It keeps you at a distance. You obviously don't want to use a used leaf blower because you don't want to be blowing sticks and debris into this. There's a much better way to do this. This is a powerful electric ducted fan. This is a 70 millimeter aperture fan from JP. These are used for RC sort of faux jet RC airplanes. And they're very powerful. This has a peak power delivery of about three kilowatts for a short period of time. So it's actually more powerful than the leaf blower. You can get these from places like Hobby King or from Amazon. And along with a controller and a set of batteries, you can run this thing and start the engine with a permanently mounted fan. Nice thing about this is because it not only looks good, but it's obviously easier to run. All you have to do is when you're ready to set this thing up, you've plugged everything in. For you headphone users on three, beware. One, two, three. Once you get this thing spinning up, then you can start doing your fuel adjustments and you don't have to hold something about three feet away from the engine. It's very convenient. Once the thing is started, you simply turn the, the power supply off and you're good to go. You want to mount this as far as possible from the engine because you don't want to obstruct flow that comes in here. And so a good guideline is to start with a temporary bracket. You mount the fan in alignment with the input. This is a 70 millimeter fan in a 53 millimeter inducer. Start it at about the distance or the length of the fan in front of the inlet for the turbocharger. Run this up to full power and see if you can start your engine. If it doesn't catch, slide your bracket a couple of centimeters closer and do it again. When you reach the farthest distance that this fan can be mounted from this face here and still reliably start, start the engine, then lock it down permanently. You want it far so you don't obstruct flow, but at the same time, it has to be close enough to be able to start the engine. And we've tested that. With this in this location here, if we run the engine and then we take the fan out and put it in, we don't see any change in the performance. We're not obstructing the flow.
The other advantage of this type of a permanently mounted fan, beside the fact that it looks kind of cool, is that when we're done with a run and we have a very hot engine, we can simply turn this up at a low power for about five, eight minutes, and this will send cool air through the entire turbo setup and cool it down so that when we want to store the engine or we want to start messing around with it, we don't have to wait an hour for this thing to convectively cool and not burn our hands. It's a really nice way to get these things started. Now, let's get into the spark and the system that gets this fuel lit. Let me show you. All right, to begin with, you want to use a spark plug. These things are nice because they're very, very robust. They'll stand up to the temperatures inside of the turbojet. And in addition, they come in a variety of different sizes and shapes to fit your particular configuration. They're also very inexpensive. Now, in order to drive the spark plug, you need a high voltage source. And when I say high voltage, I mean tens of thousands of volts. Current is not as critical, but you want a lot of voltage because you're operating in a high pressure, hydrocarbon rich environment. And to deliver that kind of voltage, your first thought might be to use a step up transformer like one of these MOTs or MOTs that we use in a lot of our different projects. Nice thing about these things is they're inexpensive and they're very powerful. But the problem is they have a relatively low step up ratio, about 20 to one. The way they operate, like any kind of a step up transformer, is that you feed line current and alternating current into the primary coil. And what this does is it produces an ever changing electromagnetic field consistent with the line frequency. And in that field, the secondary coil sits, it's immersed in that field. And as long as that field is changing, it will induce an acceleration of the electrons in the secondary coil. And every time those electrons circulate through the many, many windings of the secondary coil, they will accelerate and the voltage will increase. Now, this is only about a 20 to 1 ratio. And so even though at line voltage, this thing will get up to about 2000 volts, it's not enough for the spark plugs. What makes these so dangerous is because they can produce amps at thousands of volts, very, very high power. But it doesn't matter what kind of current you're sending out if you don't have enough voltage to be able to make the gap. You need a higher voltage. One way to do that would be to get a transformer that has many more secondary windings, but to get hundreds and hundreds of fold increase in voltage, that's a weird transformer. You might find it hard to get it. There are other ways to do this and some pretty interesting ones. One is to use what's called a voltage multiplier. This is kind of an interesting device. It's based on a little power supply that's made to energize neon tubes or discharge tubes and runs off conveniently 12 volts DC. The output is 2000 volts AC power at about 10 milliamps. The way the voltage multiplier works is that based on the alignment of the rectifiers, these black components in here, and the capacitors, when the this, this system cycles, it charges all of these capacitors at the same time in parallel to the 2000 volts of the output of the transformer. But when they discharge, when the polarity reverses, they discharge in series. So the voltage builds up 2000, 4000, 6000, 8000 as you go up the ladder. So the output of this device is about 30,000 volts, but at a correspondingly low current microamps. Now, Nice thing is it's super light because we don't have any iron core for a transformer. And if you wanted to, you could use this same sort of design with a more powerful transformer like we did in one of our power supplies to build up the voltage. But there's another way to do that. The way that you could increase the voltage of this primary transformer is obviously to put more secondary windings in it. Another way is to increase the primary voltage. Instead of 100 to 2000, you could go 200 to 4000 or 400 to 8,000. Eventually the primary is going to break down. The reason that increases the voltage is because what matters is not the strength of the field produced by the primary coil. It's the rate of change of the field. So what happens when the changing field accelerates the electrons, those electrons will feel a continuous acceleration because of the change of the field, not because of the strength of the field. So if we hook this up to a car battery and produced a very strong electromagnetic field, but a static field, there would be no acceleration. By increasing the voltage from say 100 to 200 volts, 
we increase the rate of change of the field and increase the accelerating forces and that's why we get a, a more powerful secondary output from the transformer by putting a more powerful or a faster changing field in the primary. But there's a way to cheat and that's how an induction coil works. If you can change the rate of field much more rapidly, suddenly, like plug it in or unplug it, effectively you create an almost instantaneous change in the field. And that produces a very, very violent acceleration in the secondary coil. 10 or 100 times stronger increase in acceleration and increase in secondary voltage. The way you do that is you could literally plug it in and plug it out repeatedly, or you could hook up the transformer to, say, a mechanical relay, just switching it on, switching it off, and you would increase the voltage 10 or 100 fold. An easier way to do that is to use a solid state switch, and that's what we did here in the power supply that we actually used to start the engine. What this setup here is, is outlined in this diagram over here. But it's pretty simple. These are ignition coils for, the, for an automotive application. So they're waterproof, they're very robust, and they are basically transformers, just like the MOT. They have a primary coil and a secondary coil. What we do is we charge them up. We could charge them with line voltage, but we will suddenly turn the voltage on and turn the voltage off by using an electronic switch or a triac, like this, inside of a commercial dimmer. This little $6 dimmer has a small pot that controls the frequency, or I shouldn't say the frequency, that's, that's erroneous, changes the point in the, in the voltage swing when suddenly the triac is turned on as an electronic switch. And at this point, you get an almost instantaneous or a very sudden avalanche of increased current into the, into the field, increasing the field strength. What's interesting about that is that this is actually a duty cycle dimmer. If you turn this way, way down, all it does is it selects some place in the, in the changing sinusoidal input to when it's going to turn on your light bulb. And as you increase the amount of time before you end up turning this on, you can run a very low duty cycle because very little of the actual current that's available actually flows. It's only a very small period within the 100% time that would be available for this to be, be flowing into an incandescent bulb. If we set this timer or this dimmer so that it turns on about mid position when the field is strongest inside of the inductor and then suddenly turn it on or suddenly turn it off, we will increase the field strength and we'll increase the voltage. And that's the way this works. Turn this to mid position, select the midpoint in the sinusoidal field, and we will then dump this at its highest strength and we will increase the voltage to maybe 100,000 fold. Now, in this system, to increase that even more, we add a capacitor. So the dimmer feeds into a capacitor which feeds into the input or the plus side of your inductive coil. And what the capacitor does is, is it acts as a sink, extra amount of electrical energy that can be sent in or dumped out of the inductive coil, enhancing that rate of change of the field. And the result is maybe as much as 100,000 volts. And it works. Now, the capacitor isn't really necessary. You don't need to use it, but it does enhance the performance. And the capacitor that you use has to be somewhat specialized. It has to be an AC capacitor. It can't be an electrolytic capacitor that's polarized. It has to be able to operate in either polarity. It has to at least handle line voltage. And you need something in the several microfarad range to be of any use to augment the performance. A simple solution is, along with the microwave that you tore apart for your your very dangerous MOT transformer, is a capacitor. These capacitors are rated at about 2000 volts, one microfarad, and they have a very neat little feature inside of them, which is a dump resistor. So that when you turn the system off, this will dump the electrical energy that's stored in the capacitor and change them from very dangerous to safe within 10 or 15 seconds. We decided to use a more powerful capacitor, a 30 microfarad starting capacitor. These things lack the internal dump resistor. And so across the top of these resistors, I simply put a little incandescent light. It acts as a dump resistor and also an indicator that tells us when the starter is on, even when we have the loud volume of the jet engine playing. 
And this will also then dump all of the energy when we turn this off within less than a second, changing this from lethal to safe. And this thing will store energy without such a resistor for at least several days. Seriously, you come in a couple days later and you can short this out and you get a very, very nasty spark. This works. We obviously have two of them. One is for the afterburner, one is for the turbojet. Uh, one is for the main combustion chamber. Let me plug this in and show you how this works. Now both of these are set up identically. The only difference is the spark plugs. This is as it comes out of the box, but because of the huge energy available in this system, I gapped this by taking a little Dremel and opening up the gap between the posts to give us a larger volume of interaction with the vapors inside the combustion chamber. So with these set up exactly identically, look at the difference in the spark between the two. See the little spark in there? And now take a look over here. Same setup. Now let me turn off the lights and show you what this can do. Fifty fifty water and alcohol. Kind of works. Much more reliable. So I guess it goes without saying, don't try this at home. And if you're not comfortable with a lot of the technology that we cover here, we're dealing with lethal voltages, flammable liquids, very high temperatures, lasers, find somebody in your area that can help shepherd you through this because we want you to stay safe. We want you to have fun, but we want you to stay safe. And with the kind of information that we provided you here, you should be able to put together a turbojet engine relatively easily. And if you don't decide to go that route, you can take a lot of the principles that we've covered in this series and use them for your own projects. So I want to thank you very much for watching. Really appreciate it. And if you like the kind of stuff we're covering, please subscribe. It really helps out the channel. And the bigger we get, the more we can afford to do. You take care. You have a wonderful evening. Good night.